Okay, um, thank you all for all, all for showing up tonight to the SSC Chem 1312 exam theory review. Uh, my name is Jeffrey. I am currently a PLTL leader for DenChem, and tonight I'll be your host leader for this session. So if this is your first ever SSC review, what's going to happen is that we're going to have uh, we're going to have a lecture hosted by me, and then afterwards we're going to have a problem solving section um, with practice problems after the lecture portion. I've included the QR code to the slides, so if you want to take notes on your device, you can download them and follow along. And I've also posted the link in the chat in case you want to access it from there again. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the in the main chat, and then a supporting leader will get to you. But otherwise, we're going to go ahead and get started. Okay. So the first part of this um, this review is going to focus on polyproduct acids, um, the common ion effect, and a buffer. So polyproduct acids are unique in the way that instead of having one proton or one H attached to the molecule, there are actually multiple. And so this changes the way you approach problems like finding the pH, because we have to account for all those dissociations in that molecule. So like I mentioned on the right, um, it's essentially performing more than one ice table with multiple K values. So let's say for if you have a diproduct acid, which is something that looks like this, H2A, um, it will pronate into HA minus and H plus. And this is essentially what happens when H2A reacts with water, and then it gives off the proton to make the hydronium, which I substituted for H plus, and we'll get um, the HA minus left over. In these problems, usually the first Ka's are a lot larger than the other Ka's. So I've written here, usually Ka1 is greater than Ka2. If you have more than one, if you have more than two, it's usually denoted by Ka3, Ka4, etc. So how do you do these ice tables? Well, for the first ice table we make, you would first start off by writing the general reaction. So like I listed here, and you have to use the first Ka. And why the first Ka? Well, Remember that a Ka value is the equilibrium concentration for the burnation of an acid. And so it kind of makes sense where our first Ka would be for the first pronation of the first acid and the polyproduct acid. Um, and then you would solve for X, um, finding your HA minus and your H plus solution. Now, for the next reaction, we have HA minus. Notice how we still have something to protonate here. We still have that proton to protonate. Then you would go ahead and make a second ice table, and then just using HA minus the concentration you found. Notice how I color coordinated it in blue, so it's super easy to follow along. So we're taking that concentration and then pronating it to get the A minus and then H plus. Um, next, um, Ka2. Um, this should be second dissociation. I'll quickly make a note of that to change. But Ka2 is the second dissociation, actually. Then you just go ahead and find the quantity using HA minus and then solve the ice table like you usually make. So sometimes in this, in this problem, they may ask you to find the pH value. And which one do we use? Well, we use the H plus concentration that we've calculated from the highest Ka. And why do we, we use the highest Ka? Well, it's because you, when a Ka value is given, it tells you the degree of dissociation the acid does. And so a higher degree of dissociation will indicate that it's giving more protons off. And so that will contribute more protons compared to the ones with the lower Ka. Um, like I've noticed here, higher Ka means more dissociation, thus more H plus made. And then it would contribute to the pH value instead of the Ka2. Yeah. Next, I know there's a lot on oh, this chart side. Uh, I had a question on the previous one, previous slide. Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> for the Ka2, wouldn't the would the concentration of um, H be equal to the Ka2 for the second yes. dissociation? Um, I believe so. In most problems, I know that some professors do a shortcut, but I don't really rely on that shortcut. I kind of just do like the, the full ice table in the way. So that's a good question. Maybe when we do the problem, it'll be the same. But um, I definitely would just recommend you like thinking about the process and then, um, you know. Like worry about shortcuts later. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Awesome. So next, we're going to talk about the acid-base properties of these solutions. 
And so um, just don't look at the right for now. Let's take a look at the left. So recap, um, a weak species makes a strong conjugate species in solution. So let's say that we have a weak acid. Um, the, the trend is the weaker the acid, the stronger the conjugate base. And likewise, the converse must be true. So if you say you have a strong acid or a strong base, you would get a conjugate species that is uh, respectively weak. Now we can actually go ahead and predict like the pH of these uh, these solutions by asking this one really important question: um, What is the ion associated with after reacting with water? Because we know that in acid-base reactions, usually for bases they give away pro they sorry they accept protons and acids they give away. So the resulting species or the conjugate species would determine the pH and how it would affect. And what I mean is that if you have a strong acid or base, it will not affect the pH after it's deprotonated. Why? Because strong acids and bases produce weak conjugate base and acids. Conversely, a weak acid base will make a strong conjugate base or acid, and then it, this will affect pH. Because since weak acids and bases produce strong conjugate species, then these ions will make strong conjugate acids and bases. Um, metals usually don't do not affect like light metals don't usually affect um, except uh, affect pH. Usually something like calcium, sodium that doesn't affect, but heavy metals like aluminum or iron do. In fact, will make a pH uh, negative. I mean, not negative, um, lower. So what do we? How do we kind of approach these problems? Well, you would kind of look here at the type of salt. You look at the type of salt and see what it permeates into. Um, usually, look at um, there's a, one case where usually cations associate with a strong base and the anions associate with the strong acid. So usually, going with these rules, we're going to predict that since these are the cations from a strong base and the anions from a strong acids, those species are strong, right? So whenever they are reacting with water in solution, they make weak conjugate species. So therefore, we don't expect the pH to change. Therefore, its pH is neutral. So a good example that's written here is that we have NaOH, right? And so Na, so and let's say take NaCl for example. So I'm going to write NaCl, then NaCl pronates to, I mean, dissolves into Na plus and Cl minus. Na, um, as we mentioned here, does not affect pH, so we don't have to worry about that. But Cl minus um, is a species of something. So let's kind of figure that out. What it is from? Well, we know that in order to get Cl minus solution, HCl has to react with water in order to form the hydronium ion and the Cl minus. So Cl minus is the aftermath of the protonation of a strong acid. So therefore, in solution, what's going to happen is that because it is the byproduct of a strong acid, its conjugate base is going to be weaker. So C Cl minus is the very weak conjugate base of a strong acid, and therefore, it's not going to affect it. Um, this is a little bit confusing, but we're going to do some practice. So hopefully, you know, you'll get the kind of hang of it. And then if you have any questions, you know, feel free to type it in the chat too. Um, on the other hand, if we have, let's say in this case, scenario two, a cation associated with a, streak, a weak base, let's kind of see what happens then. Okay. So usually um, NH4Cl minus, um, HCl, let's take this, look at this example. We have Cl, right? So Cl minus, we've established up here that it's the very weak conjugate base of a strong acid. So therefore, it's not going to affect pH, right? And now we have to look at the other ion that works. So um, how do we get NH4 plus in solution? Well, NH4 is, is the byproduct of the base NH3 plus water. And what happens is that since NH3 is a base, it's going to take that H from the water, forming ammonium, which is NH4 plus, and then leaving the residue of hydroxide ion. And since NH3 is a weak base, we know that weak bases make stronger, con stronger conjugate acids um, in the in the um, in the solution. And this should be NH4 plus is the strong acid, conjugate, stronger conjugate acid, right? Therefore, we can say that it's going to be acidic. So the same thing with the anions associated with the weak acid. So notice how Na, for this molecule, NaC2H3O2, um, it's going to be split into two parts. So it's going to be Na, right? It's first going to be split up. So, so Na, we know that it doesn't affect because it's a, it's a light metal. 
and we have C2H3O2. So how do we get C2H3O2? Well, we had to protonate the we had to protonate a HC2H3O2 acetic acid with water. So when that happens, the H loses the acid, and then what's left is a conjugate species or a conjugate base. And we know that acetic acid is not one of the strong acids, right? So therefore, it's going to make a stronger conjugate base. So therefore, we can say that it's going to be basic. OK. Um, so what happens when there is a scenario where we have species in solution that both affect um, like pH? Like, what if we have something that makes it some makes it acid or base? So a good example here is NH4C2H3O2. Notice how um, C2H3O2, we've established up here that it was going to make it basic, and then NH4 it's going to make it um, NH4, which is present here, it's going to make it acidic, right? So how do we determine? Well, if they both have effect on pH, um, you have to look at the KB and the KA value for the ions. So if it's acidic, if the KA for the acid is greater than the KB, it's going to be acidic. If it's basic, it's going to be KB is greater than KA. And neutral, if it's KA is equal to KB. So you would have to compare the KA and the KB value. Um, in this case, Ka for NH4 plus is that value, and the Kb for the acetic, uh, um, the in the C2H3O2 minus is is that value. So K, since Ka is greater than Kb, the solution is acidic. Okay, um, I know that was a lot, but um, we're doing some more practice, so hopefully you all get the hang of it. Uh, but if you all have any questions, feel free to ask in the chat. Okay, now we are going to talk about the common ion effect. So it's essentially when a weak acid is added to a salt that contains the same anion, and this is explained by Le Chatelier. OK, so let's take a look at a kind of example. Um, in this solution I have um, above, in this example, we are given a solution of HF, right? So HF is equal to 0.20, and, but we are adding HCl and 0.10 M to it. So in this case, um, if you add the Point, if you add the HCO, if you add the HCO, there's a common ion, right? And so when you add the common ion, your uh, solubility, I mean, it's not solubility, um, the, the values will change because of the Le Chatelier principle. When you add something to the system, it will shift to really accommodate for that change. So and it will affect your ice table. And we can go ahead and find that in some numbers, which we'll go ahead and do in like the practice problem session above. But essentially, um, the, the way to problem solve for these is that you have your regular ice table but um, sometimes you may have more than one reactant um, in your initial row, so it's really important that you account for that instead of saying that oh it's point like it's there's something in here right, but there are zero quantities for HCl plus or F minus. That's not the case because since you're adding HCl, which is H plus, is common, you have it changes your ice table value. Okay, so next we're talking about buffers. Um, this is really important because you will see this again in other chemistry classes um, in the future. So it's really important that you guys get a pretty solid foundation. So we're going to go over like what a buffer is, really. So what are they? Buffers resist pH change. Um, they are found throughout our body systems. Um, a really good example is the bicarbonate buffer system. Um, but it's essentially for in gen chem, it's made up a weak base or n conjugate acid, or a weak acid and the strong conjugate, a strong conjugate base. Um, they pr they resist pH change because they'll go undergo a reaction with the appropriate value. So, for instance, the acid part of the buffer will react with, the, with added bases. So, in this case, um, in the lab setting, what you would do is that you would see the base, and then you would put in a buffer, and that buffer will have the acid part of it, and they'll react to um, uh, to produce like the the resistance to change. Other way. Um, the base part of the buffer will react with the added acid. That should be acid right here. I'll go ahead and fix that. Um, this goes to completion. Um, and this is a limiting reaction problem because notice how we're adding two different things where we have an add solution and we're, it's reacting with the other. So in this, instead of talking about equilibrium at this point, we're talking about um, like a limiting reactant problem. So which one will dictate where the reaction goes? The limiting reactant because it runs out first. Um, the acceptable range for an effective range of a pH for the buffer is the pH is equal to pKa plus or minus 1. So um, in, in my question, you might say, which one's the appropriate buffer? So you just use this formula. And it's most effective. And when you try to keep the ratio of A minus to HA close as possible. And why is that? Well, 
Um, let's take a look at something called the henderson hasselbalch equation. So there are two different equations for this. Um, first is pH is equal to pKa plus log of the conjugate base. So that would be A minus over the weak acid HA. Um, a lot of students get confused on which one is A minus or HA. So the acid will always have one more proton than the conjugate base. Um, and this kind of makes sense because when you have a weak acid and it pronates, it loses a proton, right? So it makes sense that the conjugate base is the A minus or with one less proton. On the other hand, we have the pOH using um, pKB this time plus the log of conjugate acid this time over weak base for a weak base. So it's really important that you pay attention to which values you're given. For instance, um, if you're given a pKB instead and of a pKA, it's really important that you do the appropriate conversion. So first find the pOH using this value. And then if it's asked for pH, then just take 14 minus that, assuming you're at 25 degrees Celsius. Something about something about um, the something about this equation that's easy to mess up too is that um, they forget which is which. So for if you have a pKa, there's a conjugate base over the weak acid. However, for the pKb equation, you have a conjugate acid over the weak base. So it's really important that you know you don't like mess that up. Um, we can also substitute the log portion, like this portion, with moles because it's just a ratio, right? So it doesn't matter if you use moles or concentration. Um, they'll cancel out because it's just the ratio of the two. Um, think, I think um, that's pretty much it for this slide. So the reason why we have A minus to HA is equal to close is that that log part, this log part, will be when you have they're the same value, it will be log of 1, and log of 1 is 0. So effectively, pH is equal to pKa. Yeah, and that's pretty much it for this slide. So the this is when you're talking about the buffer equation, you have other um, other tables too, other tables too. So we have first an ice table, and that deals with a lot of equilibria, right? But however, since buffer reaction, we've established that the reaction goes to the completion because you're reacting two reactants together. Um, the limiting reactant will dictate which one is which. How it will go to reaction. So it becomes a big stoichiometry problem. Um, from Gen Chem 1, we know that it's the limiting reactant that dictates how far the reaction goes. We keep track of them in the BCA, BCA table with moles. So what is a BCA table? So B stands for before the reaction, right? So before anything has taken place. C is the um, C is the change because of the limiting reactant. So because the limiting reaction dictates where the reaction goes, you want to go ahead and just subtract the smallest value, right? Because you can't have you can't use the you can't do the equation without the limiting reagent because you know it really limits on how what you can do. Um, and then after it's just the change, right? So usually minus and then plus. So there are different differences and similarities between the BCA table and ice tables, and a lot of students get those confused. Where in notice how in this problem, right? There's one arrow, so it goes to the completion, like it was mentioned. But for equilibria problems, since weak acids and weak bases don't dissociate completely, you have to keep track of that equilibria. This is an example problem I have. Um, what is the pH of a buffer solution made of 100 mL each of 0.1 m of that, and then 0.1 m H2H3O2 after you add 10 mL of NaOH? So I would first start off by writing the reaction, right? So this is a buffer, right? And we're adding 10, 0.10 m of NaOH. So that's a base, right? And the base will then react with the acid of the solution, right? I mean, of the buffer. So I wrote NaOH plus H2C2H2O2 there. And so it becomes a double displacement reaction where the Na will react with the C2H3O2 um, and produce NaC2H3O2. But because it because those break apart in solution, um, I just go ahead and just wrote C2H3O2 minus there. And the Na plus is just like, like floating around in the beaker. Um, and then water, we don't care about, because remember, we only care about aqueous solutions, not liquids. So that's why there's nothing blank for there. Um, then you might be wondering why I put everything to moles. Well, you can't really compare different, different molarities together if they have different volume. So a good like field level field of playing, if you will, is just to putting the moles. Because moles um, really are, you can compare everything to them if that's a, if, with the same basis. So I did that by you know, taking liters times molarity, because according to the molarity formula, it's um, moles over liters. So you can go ahead and find moles by multiplying the liters, make sure 
make sure it's in liters, right, for volume, and then times the molarity. Doing that, I have, I wrote down the moles here, right? And so each problem. Notice how um, I have, I've been doing that, this is my buffer, and coincidentally, um, this mole, um, this mole is the, is the one from the buffer as well. So in this problem, this is gonna dictate change, so it's minus 0.01, minus 0.01, and you might not be able to see it here, but that looks kind of like a minus, but it's supposed to be a plus. Um, I think it's because of the quality of my writing. Um, it's supposed to be a plus because um, learning reactant is subtracted on the left, so therefore you have to have something added on the right. Um, so reactants turn into products. So um, going from there, it's going to be you know filling it out. Notice how we run out of the limiting reactant, and then we get um, the acid here, and then we get the mole here. So now I know that um, pKa, right? Um, and it will probably give you the pKa. If it gives you just the Ka, just the negative log of that. And then you just kind of plug in that ratio over here. So the big takeaway is that really understand how to do a BCA table and how it's different from an IC table. OK, cool. OK, now we're going to talk about acid-base titrations. And I wrote, please study this on the slide, because this topic is pretty rough for a lot of students. So it's really important that you do a lot of practice of this as possible. I mean, you should probably practice a lot with the other topics, but I feel like this one is pretty important and it trips students up because there's just a lot of stuff involved. So we're gonna like go ahead and just break down like what it is. What what do you do in acid-based titration? Okay, let's first review how we solve for pH though, because acid-based titrations all like the concept that we've learned before, and we really just kind of like implement them. So if you have an acid. Um, it kind of changes where if you have a strong acid, you just negative log of the H plus concentration, right? Um, keeping in track of, you know, like the ratios, of course. Um, however, if you have a weak acid and you have the Ka, it, you solve for X, which gives you the H plus, and you just negative log that value. Um, this is really important that you get that you have the Ka value. Um, sometimes they might give you a Kb value instead, but you have to do the Kw equals the Ka Kb conversion, and then you get the, your Ka that's needed. Next, if you're given a base, if you have a strong base, you just do 14 minus the pOH, and you find pOH is just negative log of the hydroxide concentration. Um, if you have weak base, however, you have a Kb, which gives you X, which gives you OH minus, negative log of that value, which gives you pOH, and then just take 14 minus that value. Um, next, we just learned about the uh, hendelson hasselbalch equation. So this is when you have um, species A minus and HA, or the acid in its conjugate base. And so you add substance to an acid base with its conjugate species. So first you convert everything most most like we did in the previous problem, do a BCA table, and then use the appropriate HH equation. So um, if you have a PKB. I have a question real quick, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I don't mind. So for, for the titration part, couldn't you also consider that a common ion effect? Yeah, um, that's a good way to think about it. Um, so once we get to fracture problems, I think it's more apparent that it's a, they're just common ion for problems, but it also kind of like depends on the problem given. But yeah, that's a good question. Okay, so moving on to the slides. Okay, so remember this toolbox. If you are like, if you want to keep this open when you're doing um, the practice problem session, then I highly recommend because we will visit each three of these things. Okay, so next is just the terms. Like, what are we talking about? So first you have the analyte, right? The analyte is the species originally in the flask. Um, usually you have a flask in a burette, and the burette is when you add something called a titrant um, to it. So the analyte is the species originally in the flask, and we're interested in finding the pH of anything in that flask. So these acid-base problems will probably be like, oh, you know, we have an analyte here in the flask, and you have we're adding um, some titrant in it. How many? What's the pH of this? That's your typical. Um, uh, uh, acid-base titration problem. Um, this is consistent um, during the acid-base problem usually, where you just have the flask, but what you're changing is that you're changing the stuff in the burette, so you're adding more titrant in in steps of the titrant, the titration, and you're trying to find the pH. Um, the titrant will neutralize the analyte, um, and then we change it. So in the lab setting, you might be asked to find the 10 ml, um, like put 10 ml of titrant, um, 20 ml of titrant, and measure you know the pH then. The equivalence point is when the mole of the analyte is equal to the mole of titrant. So that's usually at that kind of the middle point where of that like very long um, graph curve. We'll go into more detail. I have pictures later. But 
Um, it's essentially when the mole of analyte and the mole of titrant, and this is usually indicated by an indicator. Um, usually it's pink. So you real on the lab setting, you kind of just want to like record it as soon as it turns the very light hue pink, because that's actually when those moles are equal to each other. And then you also have the one half equivalent point where you have the conjugate base is equal to the concentration of the um, conjugate at the acid. So this is different from the analyte and the titrant because the, when you mix the analyte and the titrant, when they react, sometimes in leftover, you will have something called the, you will have an acid and you also have a base together. And sometimes they may be coincidentally the conjugate acid and the base of, of each other. Um, this is, may not be clear right now, but when we do practice problems, um, I'm sure it will be a little more clear. Um, this is also when pKa is equal to pH. So you remember that law, the pH, the, the HH equation has the pKa plus the log of um, log A minus over HA. So if A minus over HA is the same, then it's just one. So log of one is zero. So you're just left with pH is equal to pKa. Um, yeah. So, okay, so this is kind of the diagram I drew. Um, I'm not an art major, so please, Please don't like attack me for it. But um, I think this is really helpful. So let's kind of just go into by detail, right? So this we have this like beaker, right? Um, so that's the beaker, right? So we have the analyte and the solution I mean, in the flask. And then they're essentially adding more titrant here. Um, the goal, you're neutralizing the analyte. Um, and so in this case, oops, sorry, I did not mean to click that. Okay. Um, so in this case, the analyte is an acid. And how do you know? Well, it's because if you look at the star graph, we haven't added any titrant yet. The pH is super low. And we know that acids have low pH, so therefore we can kind of indicate it. We can kind of make sure, sure that it's a, an acid. Um, but sometimes this changes, and it would change the curve. So instead of having an acid in solution, you have like a base at the start. Um, the starting point would be higher, and it would just go in the opposite direction. And I have a few more graphs later to show. Um, if we add, as we go up the graph, and notice how there's this middle spot here, it's called the equivalence point, and where the mole of the titrant is equal to the mole of the analyte. Um, and then halfway to that point, we have the HA minus is equal to A minus. So half the equivalence point is um, when one half of the mole of titrant is equal to the mole of the analyte. That's how I like to think of it. Um, HA is equal to A minus, though. So A minus over HA is equal to 1 at one half equivalence point. So if we look at the derivation right here, um, notice how we have log of one, which is zero. So pH is equal to pKa. Um, common areas of interest. So you can kind of tell when you're at the equivalence point where since the equivalence point is when the mole of the titrant is equal to the mole of the analyte, notice how before this point, your mole of titrant should be less than your mole of analyte. And then afterward, your mole of titrant should be greater than your mole of the analyte. So that's after equivalence point. Okay, so if you, I know this is a lot, so if you have any questions, feel free to ask in the chat. Um, but yeah, so these are some titration curves that I like to point out. Um, there's like eight of them. It really depends on all the combinations you do. Um, I would not memorize these graphs, just under, kind of understand what's going on here. So usually it's neutralizing it, and then there's a point of stagnation here, and then um, it kind of just goes up. Same here. So instead of starting as an acid, we start as a base. So pH will kind of go the other way. Um, cool things I want to point out here is that if you have a strong acid and a strong base titration, um, your pH will be 7. Um, that kind of makes sense because strong bases, they have very high pH. Strong acids like have very low pH. So if you add them together, when they neutralize each other, it kind of makes sense that it will be neutral or 7. So how do we approach these problems? Um, you identify first, identify the analyte and the titrant. Um, we are first concerned about finding the pH of the analyte. After you find out that, that information, turn them into moles. Um, I would turn them into moles because we're going to need them for a BCA table. Then you would do a writing equation. It would usually be a double displacement reaction like we worked on like previous slides ago with the buffer. Um, a, a, a scenario I can think of when it's not a double displacement reaction is when you have something like NH3 plus HCl, where NH3 would be acting as a base, right? And then it would take that proton from HCl, and what's left over is the Cl minus and the resulting molecule, NH4 plus. Um, do, then you do a BCA table after you found the moles and identifies the species present. So the A row determines how you solve for pH, because the A row is after we've added 
that titrant and it takes place, that, that reaction, the reaction takes place. And so we have to like kind of evaluate by using um, the toolbox, which is was a few slides ago, to solve for pH. Um, uh, this method is different each for each. This method is different for each for each problem. So I can't really give you a one size fits all answer about how do I solve acid base titration problems. You really have to just kind of think about what is going on in the solution and how species dominates and stuff. Um, also, the the mole table, right? The BCA table is in moles, not concentration. So it's really important that no matter what you do to solve for pH, you first convert it to liters. I mean, to molarity using the liters, right? And so you also have to account for the total liters and concentration because notice how after the solution, your volume of everything changes. Um, so it's really important that you add the two volumes of the titrant and the, the, the liters of the analyte. Okay, so what are some common pitfalls, right? So you didn't account for the total volume. Um, a lot of students, they don't, they do the A table, right? And they identify like how to solve for pH, um, but they don't use the correct concentration. They just go ahead and take that mole value. And that's not the case because you know when you do um, like in these problems you kind of need to do the con the concentration. Um, another thing is do not negative log the concentration, but you negative log the moles. So what students like to do also is that with the A row they just kind of just negative log of that, you know sometimes. Um, but the thing is you can't negative log um, the moles. You have to negative log the concentration of H plus, and you find the concentration of H plus by taking total liters of and the moles. Of the, the BCA table. Um, you didn't use the appropriate KB or KA. So if you have a base, it's a KB problem. If you have an acid, it's a KA problem. So students forget to check that too. So they'll just kind of just kind of go autopilot and do the appropriate ice table, but they need to account for the KB or KA. And you're not selecting the dominant species. So um, in solution, after you do the A table, sometimes there might be um, like a strong acid only. Sometimes there might be a strong acid with other weak acids, but the, in that case, the strong acid will dominate the weak acids. So the strong acid will then contribute to the pH of the solution, even though the other two are, even though they're acids, they're not they're, they're strong compared to the um, strong ones. Okay, so we're doing a lot more practice for that. Um, but now we're gonna talk about solubility equilibria. So solubility, um, Solubility is viewed as a gradient is not, and it's not as completely insoluble as in Gen Chem 1. So if it's not completely soluble, we have something called a KSP value. And so um, to measure solubility, we have a KSP. So um, to do that, we have ice tables. And, and this time, instead of X, uh, sometimes you'll see it as like S um, for solubility. So S is what we call molar solubility here. It's going to be the most of solid in one liter of saturated solution. Um, how, and this determines the degree of solubility. So a common question you might get on the exam is that, oh, rank these by, by increasing solubility, and you're given um, a KSP value. Well, in order to do that, you can't just look at the KSP because each ion has different like uh, stoichiometry involved. So that would kind of affect your problem. Um, sometimes you get like something like 4s to the third power, you know, s squared but you have to individually solve the S value to determine, to determine solubility and not just kind of look at the KSP. Next, um, this is how you kind of write an expression. So notice how it's just the, the species in okay solutions and the A is just is a solid. So it doesn't really, you don't really care about solids in ice tables. So in the common ion effect also like applies here. Um, and then you can also do more problems with that. So Q, if we have a K, like a KSP, we also then have a Q. So let's kind of think about what's going on here. So when KSP is greater than QSP, it's going to be an unsaturated solution. Well, why? Well, if you remember when we talked about when K and Q are related to each other, when K is greater than Q, it shifts to the right, right? The reaction shifts to the right. So if it shifts to the right here, we notice that more aqueous ions are forming. So therefore, more aqueous ions can still be in the solution. Um, and it can be, therefore, it can be saturated because the possibility of there being more ions made is possible. Next, we have a case where KSP is less than QSP. So QSP is written in KSP and a precipitate form. So we know that K, when QSP is greater than KSP, what happens is the reaction shifts to the left and the solid. So therefore, more solid is being formed, right? 
So if more solid is being formed, there is going to be a P precipitate or a PBT is made. And finally, when KSP and QSP are equal to each other, they are just saturated. So they're in equilibrium with each other, and you know just nothing happens, and the solution is just saturated. Um, so there's also a difference to there's gram solubility, number of grams of solute in one liter of a um, saturated solution. So grams per liter. So if you have molar solubility, you can account for gram solubility by just multiplying by the molar mass. OK, next, we're going to talk about enthalpy, entropy, and Gibbs free energy. So this also comes back in biochemistry and other, like other science classes. So you might want to get a strong foundation in this. So when you learn it again, it's, it is, it's not too bad. OK, so from Gen Chem 1, we talked a lot about enthalpy. So this is the change in heat content. And uh, this is calculated using experimental data, right? So if you have the delta H of formation of the products and the reactants, you just do products minus reactants, and then you can kind of calculate delta delta H from there. Um, uh, this, if a delta H is positive, that means you're gaining heat. The system gains heat, so delta H is going to be greater than zero. If it's exothermic, um, it's releasing heat, so it's going to make delta H is less than zero. And here is kind of the graph. You kind of forgot, you know, what it is. It's a good refresher. Next, we have entropy. So entropy is based on the number of possible arrangements or microsites of, a various, of various atoms. So it's a measure of disorder, essentially. Um, nature prefers it. So you know, we're busy college students, and we don't really have time to clean our place. So if you kind of look at like my like place right now, it's like super messy. Like there are clothes everywhere. Um, dishes are not done. So that's why like, I don't have my camera on, because my place is a mess. So we can say that my place is like very disordered, right? Because it's natural for me to just kind of you know, just put everything here. And you know, make it messy. So we can say that my delta S is going to be greater than zero. Um, there's more disorder and more entropy. And we can say that since my room is like super messy, um, but it's super messy because like I don't because it's just spontaneous, right? Right? It takes effort or action for me to clean everything, but it's just easier if I just like leave my clothes around. So it's going to be spontaneous and therefore more disorder and thus more entropy because it's spontaneous for me to just be disorder and nature prefers disorder. Um, on the other hand, if delta S is less than zero, it's going to be non-spontaneous, right? So less disorder and less energy. So once I start picking up my clothes and I start like cleaning my dishes, then it's going to be a lot more clean. However, there will be less disorder, right? Um, and this should be less entropy. So non-spontaneous is going to be it's not spontaneous because I have to actually put effort in to like do it. So that situation, that cleaning department is non-spontaneous. It doesn't happen naturally. Um, you can also calculate this from experimental data. Um, so products minus reactants, like the delta ages. Um, so here is a definition of using the microstates. Notice how there are a lot of possibilities in here compared to the other ones. So we can say that these guys have more entropy than those guys, because there exists more microstates or arrangements. Um, in terms of arrangements, though, because for the states of matter, gases usually have the most entropy, and then liquids have the second, because gases are very, like, you know, they just free around, no have response to them. But liquids, um, they do, but not too much. Um, and then solid is just, you know, they're very contained. So less, you know, less disorder, because it's very orderly. OK, so Gibbs free energy. Um, so Gibbs free energy is. Gibbs free energy is the amount of energy available to do work in the system. So a lot of our processes in our bodies are not spontaneous. So sometimes um, they are when you can factor in other different things. And so this is essentially the measure of the free energy available to do work. Um, so delta G, if delta G is greater than 0, it's going to be non-spontaneous in the forward direction. right? So um, this is completely different from the spontaneous entropy values. So be sure to kind of like think about what you're, you're asking for. Um, if delta G is less than 0, it's spontaneous in the forward direction. So less than 0 is going to be uh, uh, spontaneous in the forward direction. This is opposite, again, from entropy. And when delta G is equal to 0, it is um, at equilibrium. So relating the three, delta G is made up of three variables, right? So we have um, enthalpy, temperature and measure disorder, or delta S. 
where delta G is the change in Gibbs in free energy, delta H is the change in enthalpy, um, temperature is in Kelvin, and then delta S is the change in entropy, right? So it's really important that you really keep your, your variables the same, right? Because usually delta S is in joules per K, J, like delta S is usually for joules per K, J, K to the negative minus one. Um, but however, when you're putting this into an equation, it's really important that you convert all of these units here. So be sure to really change, right? So, because usually entropy is given in joules per kilojoules, but delta H is in kilojoules. So the rule of thumb is just to convert the change in entropy into kilojoules per mole. Okay, so with that being said, um, we can just go ahead and move on to the next slide. So um, notice how from the previous slide, we have a delta G value. And if delta G is less than zero, it's spontaneous in the forward direction. But we have delta G is greater than zero, it's not spontaneous in the forward direction. Okay, so when we we can multi, we can then multi, manipulate these three different variables to get the appropriate values of negative delta G or positive delta G. Okay, so this is kind of a chart that I would like like memorize like really badly because this comes back again. So essentially, here are all the conditions of when everything is spontaneous and specific conditions as well. These are true for the forward reaction. And so the concept here is that you're manipulating this equation, delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S, um, to get the appropriate value. So that's the kind of thing I would memorize. Okay, so now it is 7.45. So we're gonna go ahead and take a quick break. Um, you know, go, so after like five minutes, I guess, 7.50, we can meet back and then we can talk about the practice problems in breakout rooms. Okay, you all. So welcome back. Um, it's uh, so we'll go ahead and start on the practice problem section. And so I'll give you a a few seconds to kind of read this problem and like think about how you would approach this situation. So I'll go ahead and give you a few minutes and then we can work on it together. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So if you have any questions at any moment in time, feel free to like type the chat, type in the chat. Um, I think it's better for you to just unmute yourself so I can like like hear you because um, I don't have notifications on, so sometimes I don't see the message up here. So just let me know if you have a question. And I'll periodically kind of check to make sure you guys are okay. Okay, so let's get started. So we have a sulfurous acid, which is a diprotic acid with that Ka value, and then that K, the other Ka value. So our first question asks for us to find the species present, right? So let's go ahead and kind of do that. So H2O, H2O2, when it pronates, it makes HO2. Oh, sorry, um, H2SO2. It's like, that looked kind of weird. So that, when it loses a proton, it just kind of like becomes H2, HSO2 with a minus charge to it. And then we have something that's left over, which is the H2, HSO2 minus, and then we have H plus, okay? And so we can say that this species is present and this species is present. But notice how we have an extra hydrogen here. So we can go ahead and permeate that, hence why there's a second K value. So when this reacts, equilibria will make H plus, and then we'll do SO2 2 minus. So what species we have in solution? Well, we have, we have this one. We have this one. We have H in solution. Then we have this solution. OK, cool. So anyone have any questions on that problem? If not, then we can just go ahead and talk about the next one. So list the concentration of all species present in a solution of 0.25 M H2SO2. So this is when we tackle a rice problem. So when we have the first coronation, we'll go ahead and just kind of write it there. HSO2 minus. So ice, right? Then we have it's 
So I believe this question should be uh, 0.005 instead. Okay, so we have 0 0.005, 0 0.005, right? And then we do 0 and 0, and then we do minus x, and then x, and then x, right? And 0 0.005 minus x, x and x. So we'll do set up our ice table, so solving for x, like so. And then this is equal to the first Ka value, which is 1.39 times 10 power negative 2. And I'll go ahead and you'll plug that into your calculator. And so when I plug that into the calculator, we get uh, x is equal to this really one number. So I'll go ahead and write that number for you. 0 0.008337. And then, so this one is going to be our concentration for H plus, and then also for HSO2 minus. So we can go already write our, that our H2SO, HSO2 minus is going to be that number. And then H plus, um, we'll, we'll, we might get a second H plus value, so let's hold on to that. So when we first start off in solution, right, this will pronate too. So then that will go to the species H plus plus SO2 2 minus. We do an ice table here. And then we do point, oh, um, so we do, we actually will do the species that we found, the concentration that we found from previous. Because notice how this is after it pronates, right? So we found this, so it kind of carries over to here. And then we will go ahead and kind of just do 0, 0, and that number uh, 0. So it's going to be, sorry, this should be getting a little bit ahead of myself. So this should be minus x because it's changed. So that minus x, x, and x. So solving this one will look like this. Here too, now we use the second K because it's the second dissociation for the second proton. Um, so now what happened to my, what's going on with my tablet? So one second. Okay, so. Okay, so anyways. So just plug in the Ka for that, so 4.6 times the power negative 8. And then I'll let you all go ahead and calculate your answer as I fix my uh, Wacom board. So one second. OK, cool. So when I solve for x, I approximately get um, x is equal to 0 0.004166. So it's roughly the same amount as the second Ka value. I believe. So it's kind of the answer. So wait, I'm sorry. No, no. Um, that's not the answer. I wrote the wrong one. So the answer is this for x, right? So when you get that answer, right? Notice how that, and then you kind of do the so you just go ahead and just kind of write that equation out, or the answer right here. So what is that? Well, we first have the SO2 2 minus, and that's going to be like that number, I believe. So 6.19 times 10 power negative 6. And then we have. We have, so first we have the SO2 minus concentration. We have the H2SO2 minus concentration. And then we also have species. But we have H2SO2, right? And you can find that by plugging in the rice table value for E and that species. So when you do that, you get this number. And then. Which H plus do you write down? Do you write the one for this one, or do you write the one for that one? 
Well, what we can do is we have to think about which one has the higher, higher KA value, because remember, the higher KA value is going to be the one that dictates the more permutation. So we just take H plus as the first or the higher one. OK, so that's kind of all the answers to that part. Let me know if you all have any questions. OK, so let's go ahead and talk about the next problem. So the next problem is find the pH of the solution. So pH is equal to the negative log of H plus. So which concentration of H plus do we use? Well, we use the one that's higher. So the one that's higher will give you the more pronation. So it will contribute more to the acidity of it. So we just do the negative log of the higher value, which is that really long number. And that will give you the pH of is equal to 3.8. Yeah, awesome. So let me know if you'll have any questions. OK, so for the following salt solutions, predict whether the pH of the solutions would be acidic, basic, or neutral. OK, so this is kind of like that chart we kind of talked about at the beginning. So I'll walk you like step by step on how to do these problems. So if you're like really confused, just like let me know. We can kind of backtrack. Because um, chances are, if you have a question, then someone else has the same one too. So first, um, I want to say that Na plus, this turns into Na plus and Na Ni minus, right? So let's kind of identify whether these will have effect on pH or not. So the Na plus, you know, is a small metal, so you know that they have no effect. So we can kind of eliminate that, and then we get to take a look at what makes I minus in solution. So if we have I minus, right? In solution, that means after equilibria, it had it had to like it had to have to undergo change of a with water molecule in order to get where it needs to be. So what kind of molecule will you know give you a minus? Well, I see that I minus has some one minus to it, so it must have lost something that made it positive. So we can say that it came from a HI, right? The acid. And so Let's kind of label what species we have in solution. So we have a weak acid, right? And so weak acids, they usually make strong conjugate base, strong conjugate bases, right? So therefore, we can say that this I minus, right? So this I minus is the So um, my bad, y'all. So HI is going to be actually the strong acid. So it's a little correction to make. Strong acid, right? HI is a strong acid. So therefore, this is going to be the weak conjugate base. So therefore, this would have no effect on pH. OK. So because we know that weak acids make strong conjugate bases in solution. So therefore, what's going to happen is the weak conjugate base wouldn't have effect on pH. So therefore, you know, nothing happens. So let's go with a neutral. OK, does anyone have any questions so far? To kind of like understand my thought process and how I approach this problem. OK, cool. So let's go ahead and talk about the next problem. So. We have NH4 and Br. So NH4, um, NH4 Br turns to NH4 plus and Br minus, right? So let's first take a look at the NH4. So we have NH4 in solution. So we had to have to got we've gotten that by reacting with water somehow. So how do how can we predict where like what reacted with water to get NH4 plus? Well. Notice how NH4 plus is positive, so it must have had to gain a proton. So when NH3, which is nearly charged, gains that proton here, it makes NH4 plus and OH minus. So what kind of molecules are these? Well, here is the, um, this is a weak base, right? And then weak base makes strong conjugate acid in solution. So therefore, 
we can say that this one will affect pH. So pH would be greater than, I'm mean, sorry, so strong conjugate in solution, so it's going to be less than zero for that. But we need to take a look at the other part. So we have a Br, right? So we have Br minus, which I'll write in this color. So Br minus, so Br minus, right? Same thought process. It had to have to undergo the reaction with water. But let's kind of deduce where what reaction would have happened. So Br minus will react. Um, Br minus will be achieved when you react to HBr. And HBr is what we call a strong acid. Strong acid. And then this is going to be a weak conjugate base. So this is a weak conjugate base. So it's a weak conjugate species, so no effect on pH. So the only one that has the effect on pH would be the NH4+. Uh, does anyone have any questions? OK, cool. So if no one has any questions, then we can go ahead and kind of get started on the next problem. I'm sorry? Oh, was that a question? Yeah, is B acidic? Yeah, B would be acidic because the NH4 plus is the strong conjugate acid, therefore it's less than zero. Yeah. So let me know if you'll have any other questions. So we can go ahead and get started with the next problem. So working on that same principle, we want to break it apart. Right. So NH4 plus, um, it's the same concept here. So NH4 plus, like up here, will be made when you have H2O, we have NH3. And then you'll get an OH minus at the end. So weak base makes strong conjugate acid. Strong conjugate acids will then lower pH. Okay. And then so pH is lower than seven. So we gotta check the other one first. So NO2 minus, right? H2O, right? How do we get NO2 minus? Well, notice how NO2 minus is negative, so it must have had a proton on it. And then you have OH minus left over. Okay, so we have this is a weak acid. This is a strong conjugate base. So we have two things that affect um, the pH here. We have the NO2 minus and the which will make things basic, and we'll have the um, NH4 plus, which is the conjugate acid, which will make things acidic. So how do we determine that? Well, we have to look now, in this case, the at the Ka and the Kb values. So here is the list of Ka values and Kb value. So they'll give you this under exam. So we see that Kba is greater than Kb. So we can say that overall, this will be acidic or less than 7. Okay, cool. Anyone have any questions on this? Uh, so the question is, sorry, I came uh, late before. Number one, was there a volume to convert the molarity into moles? So uh, for number one, I believe that should say, uh, it should say um, M. So M is molarity, so not moles. Does that make sense? OK, so. Next problem, the last one of this this set. So we want to take the same process. Um, so um, this was a typo in the problem set. So instead of the 0 0.250, it should have been 0 0.005. So I'll go ahead and make that correction, and then we can upload the correct key. So just scratch that out and put a 0.005. Okay. Um, all right, so if that answers your question, then we just go ahead and move on. So next one is a calculate the pH um, of 0.20 mHF before and after 0.12 mNaF is added to it. So that's going to be 
and the Ka is for this problem 6.6 .6 times 10 to the negative 4. Yeah, I think I have the wrong packet uploaded. OK, so let me go ahead and kind of fetch the right packet. And then, because um, this was a draft of mine. So I'll go ahead. Um, the problem is the same. So kind of like take a look at it at home and kind of see what you can figure out. But in the meantime, as I let you all like work on that one, I'll go ahead and try to find the correct. I believe you're muted. Oh, thank you. So sorry about that. OK, thank you so much for letting me know, because we would have continued on, and I would have just been quiet. OK, but thank you for letting me know. OK, so um, like I mentioned, um, I can find the right packet. So I will go ahead and make those changes and then upload them with the correct version. But as we do these practice problems for the recording and just for you all, I will go ahead and just make changes as needed. OK, so f minus. So I've set up the ice table here. So hf is turning to h plus and f minus ice table. So this problem would be kind of different in the fact that you don't have 0 for h plus. Rather, you have a common ion here, right? So you'll have 0.20 m of f minus. So 0.120. Like that. OK, so we have minus x, x, and then x. Then we have 0.20 minus x, x, and 0.120 plus x. So 0.120 um, plus x. So we're setting up our ice table. Looks like this. It's going to set equal to this number. And then once we solve for x, it looks kind of complicated, but because of the 5% rule, you can go ahead and do that. Go ahead and do that. Make it like your lives easier. So solving x, I get um, 0. 0.0011 for h plus. Don't forget to check your uh, comment, your 5% rule. And then um, go ahead and tell you all that it does for this problem. So don't worry about that. So to find pH, you got to do negative log of that number. You get 2.96. OK, cool. So any questions on this? OK, so next question is, which of these pair, which of this pair would make a, a weak, I mean, sorry, a buffer? So buffer as from the PowerPoint. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so uh, I can go back. But um, this, these, this, the answer key will be posted later um, on the SSC website. So you can just like, you know, quickly screenshot or write it down if you will. But they'll, There'll be a correct version of the key uploaded for your 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 reference. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, so out of the problem solving session, just kind of like try to take in like how to solve it, and then you can go back and like kind of work out on your own to see if you get get it or not. So um, we have a weak acid, right? So buffers are made of weak acid, and they conjugate base, or the weak weak base and the conjugate acid. So which one is that? Well, we know that HI is a strong acid, so that is invalid. And then we know that HCO is also a strong acid, so that's also invalid. So therefore, we get this one. NH3 is a weak base, and its conjugate acid is NH4 plus when you receive the proton as a base. OK, any other questions on this one? All right, so if not, then um, a buffer has a pH of 4.7 that contains a weak acid of Ka of that value. The ratio of weak acid to conjugate base is what? OK, so um, when you're talking about buffers, I just like to write out like the equation. Like I know that's OC with it. So we have a Ka, so that would be log, um, so that would be negative log of Ka plus a minus over HA. So we can just kind of go ahead and plug that in, plug everything in. So what do we have here? We have a 
4.87, right, for pH. And we also have a Ka, which is that. And we do the that value of that, OK? And then we just write the leftover part. So I'll give you all a second to kind of go ahead and do the math for this. So I'll just give you one second to plug that into the calculator. So working on this problem, um, once I do the math, I get 10 to the power of 0 0.005514 is equal to A minus, oh, sorry, I meant there's a log here. Okay, so A minus over HA, right? So we take, we undo the log by taking to the base power of 10. And so we, in order to do that, we get that value. But um, notice how the problem is asking the weak acid over the conjugate base. So that would look like HA over A minus. So our actual answer is this, but you take the reciprocal of that. 05514. And that should give you. 0.987. Okay, um, anyone have any questions on this? If you all do, um, don't be afraid to ask, okay? All right, let's move on to the next problem. So a buffer is made by preparing 50 ml of that quantity and then that quantity, right? Uh, given that the K of the SEO asset is that value, um, A, find the pH of the buffer. So anytime you're given a buffer problem, always convert everything to moles. So in order to do that, we have 0.05 liters of um, potassium acetate. So that looks like KC2H3O2, right? How do we get the 0.05? Well, we do 50 divided by 1,000 to change the liters times the one, so times 1.0. Zulu 0.05 mole of KC2H3O2. Um, if we wanted to be really specific, this is also equal to um, 0.05 mole of uh, C2H3O2 minus. And also 0.05 mole of K plus, but we don't really care about K plus um, or like other metal ions. So doing the other problem, we get the same thing, right? Times one, H3O2, 0 0.05 mole of H2C2H3O2. OK, so the way I kind of did that is that I first kind of did everything by taking the liters and multiplying it by the molarity to get the moles. Because remember from the HH equation, we can also work on moles. And it's actually really recommended for you to just convert it because it kind of levels everything on the same playing field. Um, anyone have any questions so far? If not, then we can go ahead and just kind of continue. So. Um, find the pH of the buffer. So. This is a buffer problem, so pH is equal to pKa plus log of A minus, right, over HA. So that looks like in this problem, we can take the moles too. So A minus, let me go ahead and just kind of highlight that for you all so it's easier. So A minus would look like the 0.05 mole of acetate anion. And then there's also the mole of acid, which is in this color. So that over yellow. Cool. So pH is equal to pKa. So we don't have pKa, so it's negative log of 1.8 times 10 to the power negative 5 plus um, log of 0 0.05 over 0 0.05. So that's going to be pH is just equal to the pKa, which is 4.74. And log of 0.05 over 0.05 turns to log of 0, I mean log of 1, which is 0. OK, anyone have any questions on this problem?
Um, so um, whenever you found the PKA, that was negative log of uh, the KA. Um, and did that get you? Um, oh, wait, no, no, never mind. Never mind. This, this, I see what you did. Yeah, for sure. Um, no worries. So um, PKA, like, you know, pH is negative log of H plus concentration. POH is negative log of OH concentration. So it makes sense that PKA is just negative log of your K. But yeah, good for pointing that out. So let's kind of go ahead and kind of look at the next problem. Find the pH of the solution after 3 ml of 0.1 m NaOH is added. Okay, so this is a base, right? And so if you remember from the PowerPoint that if you have a base part, if you have put in a base, it will react with which part? Do you all remember? Which part does the base react with? So it will react with the acid part of the buffer. And so let's kind of write that reaction out. So NaOH plus the acid part of the buffer. The acid part of the buffer is C2H3O2. And then we kind of can kind of predict, right? So double displacement reaction. Water is made. We don't care about water. So let's do that. Let's keep that in mind. And then we have NaC2H3O2. So um, this was a another error. So it's actually going to be KOH. So, so ignore this and then want KOH. Okay, cool. So um, when we do eyes, I mean, so this is a completion reaction because buffer reactions, they always go to completion. So therefore, um, let's kind of go ahead and time, time, turn this into moles. So go ahead and do this in a different color for you all. So we do uh, 0.03 liters, right? So 0.03 liters times 0.1. That is going to give you 0 0.003, I believe. And so we can kind of write 0 0.003 in there. And then C2H3O2, well, um, we also had that from like this part, right? So in the pink. So that's how we had that here. And we coincidentally have that there. And then K. C2H3O2, that's also the part of the buffer. So it was in yellow, so right there. So if we go ahead and kind of just like put the numbers respectively, we have from up here the problem, 0.05 mole. Then from the K, the acetate. So K, C2H3O2 will turn into C2H3O2 minus, which is like that here. So we do 0.05 mole of that. And it becomes a limiting reaction problem. So the less mole detects what where the reaction goes. So we have less of KOH. And then on the reactant side, we have to add it. Okay. And then when we do that, we have zero left over. And then when we do the math here, we get um, 0 0.047, I believe, and then 0 0.05. 0 .00, 0 0.05. 0 .0, 0 0.053, sorry, cool. So doing this, we have pH is equal to, so what do we have in solution after? We have a weak acid and we have the base. So we can go ahead and do the um, pKa formula. So pKa, pH is equal to pKa plus log of A minus over HA. And so pH is equal to um, we have the pH, pKa, which is 4.74, which we found in the previous problem, or negative log of 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5, log of point, oh, make sure you kind of check to which one's correct. So we have A minus, the conjugate base is going to be the 5,3, because it has one less proton than the weak acid, which is HC2H3O2. And then we kind of plug that number into our calculator. Okay. Wouldn't K2, yeah, so we'll post the key later. 
Um, but there is a question. I think you missed a zero for the number of moles of acid, 0 0.005. Oh, my apologies. Yes, good catch, you all. So um, that kind of go ahead and changes a little bit of the problem. Good catch. So wait, hold up. So wait a minute. So, so 0 0.05 times 1 is just 0 0.05, I believe. So 0 0.005 moles. Um, so the way we got the acid is because we took 0 0.05 times 1. So it just becomes 0 0.05, I believe. Let me know if that makes sense. Oh, yeah, no worries. No, oh, good catch. So actually, you're totally good. So yeah. Yeah, so it's really easy to kind of trap up your numbers. So all good. Yes. So um, where can I find the key? The key we posted. Would you use the final part from part A? Yeah, you. Uh, that is correct, because you want. You would use the A value because what the A row tells you is that after the reaction is complete, so you would use the A after the reaction of the KOH plus the acid part of the buffer. Does that make sense? So your answer to your question is use the A, the A row, because the A row accounts for after the reaction. So are you talking? Oh, for your okay. So you're talking about part A, right? Okay. So part A. Um, you haven't added anything to the buffer yet, right? Because in this part B, we're adding the base, right? But in part A, we are just, it's just asking us to find the pH of the buffer as it is, if that makes sense. So that's before we use, before the addition of anything, if that makes sense. Does that help a little bit? Yeah, okay, yeah, awesome. I'm glad that helps. So um, the point of this question is to kind of see like, oh, you know, this is before the pH of the buffer existing by itself, and then saying, seeing what the pH happens after you add some base. So um, if I did my work correctly um, and I plug in that calculator, so we get around 4.69. So notice how the pH of the buffer is 4.74, right? And then like the the resist the resist, the change in pH was like super negligible because that's what a buffer does. Okay, cool. So let's go ahead and do the next problem. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, if you all do, please let me know because I know I talk a little bit too quickly. So just let me know if you have any questions. Because chances are someone else has them too. Um, that's a good question. I wouldn't think of it like. Because the point of a buffer is to not affect pH at all. So after you add something to the pH, I mean, after you add something to the buffer, it doesn't matter where something decreases or increases. Rather, you're more concerned about neglecting that or making that pH change in insignificant. So I do understand why you think that the pH would kind of increase, but I feel like the more important thing is, is that the buffer um, stays the same or the pH resists change. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, okay. So uh, let me go ahead and kind of see. I can just go ahead and check my numbers again. That's not a problem at all. One second. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, you are right. So you are right because I plugged in my. I had fa I have fast fingers. So uh, it's actually not four point six nine, but it's four point seven nine. So I really encourage for you all to do this problem log for me so that, because, um, you know, I'm human too. So it's actually 4.79. But yeah, good catch. So if I plug in that number in the calculator, it was just a calculate, slight calculation error from my part. Does that make sense to you all? OK, cool. Awesome. Good catch. Alrighty, so so the next part, um, 0.025 ml, right? 0.025 ml of HBr. Okay, so it's added to the buffer. So acid reacts with base of the buffer. 
So writing it out, we have HBr plus KC2H3O2. Do the double displacement reaction. We have KBr plus HC2H3O2. So crisscross, goes here, goes here, goes here, goes here. So rough reactions are to completion. We have to do a BCA table this time. Um, and so we do, well, we need to convert the HBr into moles. So we do this one. So 0 0.025 times 0 0.3 is going to be 0 0.0075. And if you um, kind of like see a number or two, just like let me know, because then I can go ahead and check it on my end. So we do that. KC2H302, we have it from up here, so right there. So we can go ahead and say that's 0 0.05. We do KBR and then do that value. And so 0 0.075 minus 0 0.0075, and then we do plus 0 0.0075, and then plus 0 0.0075 too. So we get uh, after the after row, so we get for K. We have 0 0.0425, then we have 0 0.0075 for here, and then we have uh, 0.0575. So I notice in solution I have the uh, base and the and the conjugate acid. We also have a Ka that was given up there, so we have to do the pH formula for the HH equation. So go ahead and just kind of overlap this problem. pH is equal to 4.74 plus log of 0.0425 over 0.0575. Okay, so I'll go ahead and do that number as well, so you guys can do it as well. So the answer is pH is equal to 4.6. And this actually makes sense, because adding an acid should make it less, um, less Make sure that's on the pH. OK, does anyone have any questions here? Again, thank you all for catching that key up there. Um, yeah, so if you have any questions, feel free to let, me, to let me know. So the next problem is the buffer capacity problem. So um, remember that you want A minus over HA is equal to 1 as close as possible, right? So go ahead and do that for all of these problems. So we have uh, the first one, we have 0 0.750 over 1.120. Why do I arrange it like this? Well, I want the ratio to be closest to 1. So that gives me 0 0.669. The second one, I get 0 0.750 over 0 0.569, which is 1.32. And then the third one is 0 0.750 over 0.8. 0 0.882. Okay, so we need to figure out which one's closer to one. So roughly speaking, this one is closer to one than this one is. So the answer is the second problem, the second one. Okay, does anyone have any questions on this one? Okay, if not, then we can go ahead and get started. Okay, so this is an acid-base titration problem. So these kind of can, can, can get complicated. So if you have any questions, I really recommend just asking them because it's just really hard to find your way back if you like get lost. Okay, so a student tri titrated um, 20 ml of a 0.05 HMHNO2 um, solution with 0.02 m of NaOH. Given that the Ka of HNO2 is that value, find the pH of the solution if the following volumes of titrant are added. So OK, let's kind of just draw what's going on, because I feel like if we draw it, it'll be like super easier. So in these problems, we have the analyte and the titrant. So let's go ahead and call the analyte this blue color. Let's draw that in here. And then we have the burette, you can say it's pink. So um, what's the analyte here? Well, it says that we have 20 ml of 0.05 NHO2 solution. It titrated that solution with the 0.02 m of NaOH. So in this solution, the blue is going to be 0.05 m HNO2. Okay, 
So what's going to happen is we have that. And then in the titrant, we have the point O2M of NaOH. OK. And so we're not given the volume, but we're given the volume of the titrant in A, B, C, D, and E. OK. So let's go ahead and kind of just figure out what's going on. So if you look at the part, so you first just want to convert everything to moles. So we have this one, right? 20 ml of that solution. So to convert that, one, we just take 0.02 liters times 0.05 m of H, H, and O2. And then we get 0 0.001 mole of H, and O2, OK? So this doesn't change. And this is really important. We'll keep a hold on to that. Now we're given the volumes of titrant. So we have the volume of titrant. We also have the concentration of titrant, which is up there. So we can do uh, 0.01 liters times 0.02 to find the mole of the titrant. So we get 0.002 mole. Uh, does anyone have any questions on how I get these numbers so far? Um, if not, then maybe we can keep continue. So um, if we are, so the next step I would say is to make the reaction, right? So in the lab, I'm putting HNO2 and I'm putting that with the titrant, which is NaOH, right? And then we do the double displacement reaction. So water is formed from HNOH. We don't care about that. And we do NaNO2. So we do um, BCA, right? BCA, right? Because this is a buffer problem, so we do BCA tables. So we do 0.001, right? So as we calculate that up here in the group in the blue, we try to make things consistent for you all to follow that. And then we have NaOH. We need the mole of that, which is this number, which we got from that value up here. And then we don't have anything at the start. So we do uh, we do a limiting working problem. So that. And then we do there. OK. So when we subtract, we get this number, 0 and 0 0.002. Does anyone have any questions so far? OK, if no one has any questions so far, then we can keep going. Um, so the next step is to kind of identify what species is present. So we do, OK, so I see that we have HNO2 that has substance, and then that has substance. Well, what do I notice about those two? We have NaNO2 in solution, and then we have HNO2. Notice how this is a conjugate. So we have this is a conjugate. We have the acid, right? And then we have a conjugate base. So how do we solve pH when we have an acid and a conjugate base? We just do the HH equation. So pH is equal to pKa plus log of A minus over HA. And then we do this problem as so. So plug in your values. So negative log of 4.0 times 10 to the power negative 4 plus log of 0 0.002 over 0 0.008. Make sure you label the correct one. So A minus over HA. So you get a pH of 1.79, I believe. Okay. Anyone have any questions? And um, uh, how did you know again to do A minus over HA, or did you just pick one? Um, that's a good question. So um, notice how when we have the con we have an acid, right, and we have a conjugate base in species, that's going to be the hendelson hasselbalch equation. And so the HH equation, if you have a K, is pH is equal to pKa plus log of A minus over HA. So the only reason you would do HA over A minus is when we're given a pKb. So you would do pOH is equal to 
pkb plus h log of ha or a minus. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes it does. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Uh, oh, yeah, good, and good catch. That's another catch. So um, I accidentally forgot to write a zero. So, but the number should be the same. Let me go ahead and just double check that. Out. Yeah, I kind of got the same number too. So, cool. All right. So next problem. Um, this time we're given 25 milliliters of titrant. So let's go ahead and turn this into um, moles using the given molarity. So this changes, right? So we still have that 0.05 mHNO2 with the 20 ml in it. So you would have kind of to like look at it differently. So what's different is you have the titrant here, right? And that's changing. Instead of 10 milliliters this time, we're adding 25 milliliters. So in order to do that, we have 0 0.0025 liters when we divide that by 1,000. And then we do 0 0.02 m, which is like the concentration. So that, if I multiply correctly, it should be this number. And let me go ahead and double check that. I encourage you all to do as well. And yeah, it is. One, two, three, four, four zeros. Got it. OK, so next up, I would write the equation out. So like, what's happening in this titration? So HNO2 plus NaOH yields NaNO2 plus H2O. So we do BCA. Gotcha. OK, that's a good point. So 0 0.025 times 0 0.02. And then you just sub in zeros. So like that. So HNO2 is going to be um, 0 0.001 if we got that problem from up there. And then we have NaOH, which is another 0 0.005. And then we do zero because we have none of that in solution. So anyone have any questions there? So we subtract this because this is the limiting reactant. It controls where the solution goes, where the reaction goes, I mean. And so we do 0 0.001 minus 0 0.0005. So we get 0 0.0005. 0 and 0 0.005. So the next step is to identify what you have in solution. So in this case, I also have an acid and its conjugate base. So when you have a conjugate acid in its base, you this becomes a HH equation problem. So okay, so and then plugging that in, we get negative log of the pKa is. 4.0 times 10 to the 4 plus log of a minus, which is um, 0 0.0005 over 0 0.0005. And so we, when we do that problem, we get pH is equal to, can you also get 0 0.0005 of total volume and get the log of that? Can you get log of that? That's, um, I don't think so because well, both of them are like weak species, right? So weak species, you have to do the ice table. And because there are two of them, it kind of gets jumbled. So in this case, when you have a case of an acid and its conjugate species or the conjugate base present in solution, then what you want to do is you want to use the HH equation because you have the A minus and the HA. Does that make sense? That's a good question. So you would have to do the HH equation instead of that. Let me know if that makes sense or not. Okay, cool. Awesome. Good question. So when we do that, notice how log of the same the number over the same number is just log of one, which is just log, which is just zero. So pH therefore is just the, this value, which I believe is. Uh, let me go ahead and just do the math real quick. Three point three nine seven. So in this case, we are at one half equivalence point because a minus is equal to j. 
Okay, cool. So let's go ahead and get started. So volume needed to reach equivalence point. Okay, so this one is a long question. So um, let me know at any point if you have any like comments or concerns. So how do we get the, the volume needed to reach equivalence point? So we know that the equivalence point is defined as when the mole of the titrant, right, is equal to the mole of the analyte. Another way you can write mole is by taking mt mole of the titrant, mole, I mean, sorry, concentration of the titrant times the volume of the titrant is equal to molarity, I mean, concentration of the analyte times the volume of the analyte. Okay, so what do we have here? Well, in this problem, we're given the leader, we can find leaders and we're given the concentration. So we can go ahead and put that down. So when we, we have a concentration of 0.05, and then we have a leader of 0 0.02, 0 0.02, because we convert that to milliliters to liters. Let me just go ahead and make that conversion just to double check. And it is, okay, cool. And so the mole of titrant, right, so that part, we have the concentration of the titrant, which is 0 0.02. So we can go ahead and put that down as 0 0.02. And so we kind of need to find the V of T. So doing algebra, notice how this looks like the, um, the what's it called, the dilution formula. And that's essentially what you're doing here. So when you get, when you solve for X, you get 0 0.05 years. And so we need this volume of NOH to reach equivalence point. Okay, does anyone have any questions on how I get this number? Okay, so if no questions, then um, if we have a liter of NOH, right, we have that. And then we also have the concentration of NaOH, which is 0 0.02. And then that gives me, if I plug that into my calculator, 0 0.001, okay? 0 0.001 mole of NaOH. So, um, so we have that. Now let's write the reaction as to what goes on. I'm going to do 0.001, which we got from up here, like way back up here, right? We do NaOH, which is, what did we find that? We found that it's um, it's going to be 0.001, which we did up here. That's there, that's zero, nothing has happened yet. That, and then add that. And then we do 0.001. We have zero, zero. So what kind of problem do we have to do here? Well, we have a base here, right? So when you have a base, a weak base, in fact, because it's not one of the strong bases, this becomes a an ice table problem. So we kind of have to figure out like what the reaction is. So we have NaNO2, right? And then we react it with water, which will give us HNO2 and plus OH minus. So it is, this is kind of a weird concept. So does everyone like kind of understand how I got this? Because it's weak base, so we need to react it with an equilibria as an ice table. Does that make sense, you all? Okay, I'm hoping it does. But if it doesn't, then just let me know. So ice, right? Okay, so ice tables, you need concentration, right? For ice tables, but for the mole for the BCA table, you just need moles. So it is super wrong if you just go ahead and put 001 mole into this part because that is not the concentration yet. So we need to find the concentration of NaNO2 max. So that's just going to be the moles of it and the liters. Okay, this is really important, and I kind of want you all to understand that the liters of the total liters is going to be this one, the 20 ml plus this one, which is this one here. So it's going to be the liters of the initial, the anal, the titrant, I mean, sorry, the analyte, plus the liters of the titrant added. Because that's what happened in root solution. 
um, we combine the volume, so it makes sense that the total volume should be the sum of the two. Does that make sense? It accounts for the total volume. So this is like a killer. We don't do this on our exam because you need to account for that. OK, cool. Um, please let me know if that makes sense or not. OK. So finding the concentration of this value. Oh, is that a question I hear someone? OK, if not then. But if you guys have a question, please ask. <laughs> so 0 0.014286 concentration, OK? So that's going to be 0 0.014286 we put in here. Let me go ahead and make this easier to like kind of see. So that and then that. Um, we have carrot water. And so initially start, we do that, plug in your ice table. OK, so um, this is a base, right? So we need a KB. Are we given the KB in the problem? No, we're given KA, right? That's really that's also important to take note of. This is a KA problem, right? So if the KA, if it's a KA, but we need a KB because of the base, we need to do another conversion. We need to do KA, KB is equal to KW at 25 degrees Celsius. So this is just 1 times 10 to 14. KA is this number, like it was mentioned in the problem. KB is that. And so solving for KB, we get equal to 1 times 10, uh, sorry, 2.5 times 10 to the power of negative 11. OK. OK, so that is a KB. And we use the KB because it is a base, right? So this is a base. This is a base. We need a KB. So a killer on your exam would be you just went in and did this problem, but you use the KA. Because even though it gives you the problem, you need to do that one conversion. So I can't really stress that enough because it's really important. Okay. So x squared is that. Solving the ice table, we get this is equal to that number, which is the KB. So OK. And so solving this number is going to be, when we solve this, use your 5% approximation rule. I'll go ahead and um, tell you that it does. So x, which is your hydroxide concentration, because you know solving for the x row here, is going to be 5.97 times 10 times 3. OK. So in order to get that, when you take the negative log of this, it gives you POH, not pH. What you can do is is that to mess up, you did all this work, but then you report it as, oh, this is pH. But that's not the case, because it's OH minus. OK? So um, when you solve that, you plug in pH, you get 6.22. So to turn to pH, just take 14 minus 6.22, and we have um, 7.78. OK, OK. So if you are, if you kind of got lost, please let me know where you're so that, or you want me to repeat this process again, because this is like a lot. OK, um, I see no questions, so I'm hoping that it makes sense. OK, so it's almost 9. So if you all need to go, then, um, then you know, did it ask for the volume? Um, yeah, so it did. And we solved that using the, the, the problem here. So we did the dilution formula. So the volume needed to reach EQ point, right? Um, yeah, so it asked for the volume of the EQ point at the to reach the equivalence point. But you could have also, like, another problem they could have asked you was, like, find the pH of this point. So you have to do all this work to get the pH. So this is the volume to reach the P equivalence point. This is the pH. Where can we find the key again? It will be uploaded on the SSC website. I mean, on the YouTube channel. OK, any questions? OK, so since it's almost 9, if you all need to go, um, I understand it's late. But um, I will stick around and finish the key. So if you want to stick around. But if not, if you want to watch the video when it's posted, that's perfectly fine too. OK, so 
we have this next problem, right? We have um, here. Okay, we have uh, 60 milliliters of titrant. So we have 0 0.06 liters times 0.02 m of NaOH. And then when we do that math, we get 0 0.0012 mole of NaOH. Okay. Um, so once we do that, we get that number. So running the reaction out, we get HNO2 plus NaOH is NaNO2. So we do BCA, right? So we get the mole. We have HNO2 from the, the first part up here. It doesn't go away. Plus the NaOH, which we found. Zero. We subtract 0 0.001 because that's a limiting reactant. And then we do add 0 0.01. Do zero and then point point um, that number, which is going to be point oh 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 two, and then we have um, plus point oh one. Okay. So next, I would identify what I have in reaction. So so I'm going to go ahead and identify like what I have in solution. So I have this in solution, right? I have this in solution because that's a number. So labeling what you have next, you have a strong base, which is NaOH, and you have a weak base. So how do we solve for, P for, um, for, for pH here? So do we have to look at this one or do we have to look at this one? Well, it is the strong base that we're concerned about because strong base still dissociate more. And so if it's the strong base that dissociates more, um, we can do we this controls pH. Controls pH. This one we do not care. Do not care. Okay, so how do we find pH of an NaOH? Well, pH is, we know that it's just 14 minus um, a negative log of the OH, the OH concentration. So doing that, it's 14 minus um, negative log of 0 0.002 over, that's how it's like an over button. So we have to account for the total volume, right? So 0 0.06, right? because this is the volume of titrant we're added. And then we also have to account for the 20 ml, the 0 0.0 liter, 0 0.02 liter from the analyte that was at the start. OK, so um, with that being said, what we can do is we do, so I'm going to go ahead and give, give, you all, give you all a second to do the math. And I'll go ahead and do it myself just to make sure you know, everything's good. OK, so I should have gotten um, the answer is 12.33, approximately. Um, let me know if you all get a different number or yeah, if that number looks, looks correct. I'm sure it does. So let me just go ahead and plug it in, because I know it's a lot of math, especially for 9 PM. So. OK, so I actually um, got a different number. So it's like this number, it's that, 4, 0. OK, cool. So that's the correct answer for that. And yeah, so these acid-base titration problems are a long. So I would definitely recommend like using the blank key and trying to see if you can rework it and if you can get the correct answer. So let's go ahead and move on to the next problem. So the KSP value of cobalt phosphate is that. So you might want to write the, the equation for solubility. So just that's the formula for that compound. We do CO3 2 plus plus 2PO4 3 minus. OK, so we do 
So we want to do an ice table for this, so ice goes to keep track of solubility. So this would be 0, 0. This would be 3s. This would be 2s. That's 3s and 2s. So 3s to the, so if we're running a KSP expression, we do KSP is equal to 3s to the third power over 2s to the second power. OK, so all you got to do is to solve this, right? So plug in KSP. So KSP is this value is equal to that. So I'll just go ahead and give you all the algebra. So it's going to be x is equal to 4.53 times 10 to negative 8. OK, so. Um, Next, the next problem, um, calculate the molar solubility when cobalt 2 phosphate is dissolved in 0.2 mm of that. So this is going to be the same problem, right? The same ice table. So we have this. And then we do 3s and then 2s and then 2s, and then that's the change. So 0.2 plus 2s, we do 3s here. And then we do setting it to equal to KSP, so 3s to the third power over 0.2 plus 2s to the second is equal to KSP, which is that value, right? And so you can do the approximation method. So just cancel this out. And then solving for x, you get this, which is that. And so notice how it's smaller than this one up here because of the common ion effect, where the value gets bigger to uh, the smaller to account for the shot layer. OK, so um, in the lab, the student calculated the molar solubility of PBI2 in the water and found that the value was that value. So do you expect a PPP to form? Well. When we have a QSP, um, that's a QSP, right? Because we're talking about the stuff in the lab, so like not at equilibrium. So QSP molar solubility is an S. So just plug that in. And then 3 and then 2 times 7.83 times 10 to the power of negative 9 squared. So when you calculate QSP, it's going to be 3.179 times 10 to the power of negative 19, I believe. Actually, I think that's 39. OK, so it is very, it is a lot smaller. So QSP is greater than KSP. So therefore, there is a power permissivity that is formed. OK, so I'll go ahead and kind of like zoom past these questions, because I know that um, it's late. So bring the ionic compounds from most soluble to least. So the way you would approach this problem is that you go ahead and find the S like we did up here, or the X. And you have to rank it from the S, not the KSP value. Because why? Well, S contributes to molar solubility. So you would have to look at the individual values. So when we do that, we do. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and quickly like show you all like the answer. So it's 1, 2, 3, and 4 in terms of most soluble to least. OK, so um, given the change in entropy and enthalpy values, predict whether or not the reaction can be spontaneous and what conditions, if any. So this is going to be negative, right? It's a negative delta H. This is a positive delta H. Um, uh, and then this is going to be spontaneous. So if you have a negative delta H and a positive delta S from the chart, um, I recommend memorizing that chart. This is going to be spontaneous at all temperatures. And then if this is the positive delta H, it's positive. Delta S is going to be negative. So when you have a positive delta H and a negative delta S, you get non-spont at all temperatures. OK, so let's take, we don't know the delta H for that, and delta S for that. So Um, 
So let's take a look at those. We have CO, the CO, and then we have CO, and then CO. OK, so uh, what? So we need to break this bond in order to get those two CLs. So we need heat. And we supply heat, delta H is positive, or greater than 0. So this is a positive value. Um, entropy, right? When we talk about the entropy, um, when we're comparing CL and CL, right? And it's going to be, we have two CLs that are not connected by one. Not connected. And then we have this is connected, right? So you would expect this one to have more disorder than this one, bonded by a bond, because these guys don't have a bond connecting to each other. So they can like feel free to like move around. So this is going to be more disorder. So when disorder is delta S is greater than 0, so um, I'll give you a second to kind of look like what happens when delta S is greater than 0 and delta H is greater than 0. So one second. So that would be spontaneous um, at high temperature. OK, um, that's pretty much it for that problem. Um, for this one, um, this reaction, so just delta H, delta, so calculate delta G. So delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. OK, so all you have to do is just do products minus reactants for all of them. And then, yeah, so yeah, no worries. Um, so just do this volume, so this this equation, so just do products minus reactants. Um, make sure you convert this to um, kilojoules, and then you just comp you complete that too. And so this is in common. Okay, and that's the answer. And the correct number, if you're really interested in trying it at home, is this number. Um, is negative 4.82 kilojoules. And I'll let I'll that work, but I know it's late, so I won't, don't want to give you like too long. OK, so thank you all for staying at the end. Um, good luck on your exam, and you know, best of luck. So make sure to keep practicing and stuff. Great. Take care. Yeah, thank you.